Well, welcome once again. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, we welcome you here. Hope that you feel encouraged and we're glad that you're able to worship with us this morning. Um, We are in the Gospel of John and uh, we've kind of done this a few times where we will study in depth for several weeks and really look at it uh, in those minute details, kind of take a a magnifying glass, so to speak. Uh, But today we want to start off by kind of giving a big picture once again. I think it's always helpful, even with any Bible book that you go through and study, we want to go deep, we want to dig into those good details, but we never want to lose sight of the overall story, the overall theme of the message that's being conveyed. And so we want to back up and remind ourselves of that as we talk more about the Gospel of John. Um, We love how John does a great job of outlining his gospel for us. And he kind of gives some key phrases, some identifying pieces that really set the, so, set the stage for everything that's going forward in the gospel. And so we see in the very first chapter of John, that uh, John just emphasizes that the word became flesh. And we know that the word is referring to Jesus, and it's that amazing just picture that Jesus, God himself, came from heaven and took on human flesh. He was willing to make that transition. He was willing to enter this world, to put on the limitations of mankind. And he willingly did that so that he could be here with us. So the word became flesh. And we see that emphasized in the first chapter of John. Uh, Towards the end of chapter 1, all the way up through the end of chapter 6, we see just this theme that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And just that fact that as the word is part of mankind, that he dwelt with us. We were able to see his actions. We talked about many of the miracles that Jesus has done up to this point, that he's healed people. Again, he walked on water like we talked about last week. He fed 5,000. And we've seen these demonstrations of his glory. We've also seen him claiming his glory, that he claims to be equal with his father. And so he's dwelt among us, but we've also seen his glory. And unfortunately, kind of the next portion, the next piece in the outline is from chapter 7 to 13. And we see really that even though he came to his own, his own did not receive him. And just that sad fact that even though Jesus presented himself to the Jews, he presented himself to the Samaritans, to his disciples, there are some who did receive him, but there are many who rejected Jesus. There are many who Again, maybe there are aspects of Jesus that they liked, but when Jesus really revealed himself for who he truly is, there are many who rejected that. The final piece of the, the, the piece of, uh, in the Gospel of John, the last few chapters, chapters 13 through 20, again, just claim that great truth that those who received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. And how we just view the cross, we view what Jesus has done on our behalf, that he came, he lived that perfect life, he died for us to pay the price of sin. We didn't stop there, that he rose from the dead. And just that beautiful piece that those who receive what Jesus has done for us, they can have life, they can have forgiveness, they can be children of God. And so John kind of picks up on these main themes and there's really some clear divisions within the gospel that lay out this outline for us. So we focus specifically towards the end of chapter 6 and we see just these kind of two words, these two phrases that are a great identifying piece for us. That in the midst of this portion where Jesus is dwelling among us, we're beholding his glory, we see really grace and truth being emphasized. What we mean by that is Jesus has shown his grace. He has demonstrated his grace to the people in the miracles and the compassion that he has shown for them. We see in two weeks ago when we talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000, he demonstrated his compassion and his grace to them. Even with Jesus walking on the water last week, he came to his disciples, he calms them, he revealed himself to them, the storm again ceased, he took them to their final destination, again grace was demonstrated to them. And yet, all of those miracles, all that took place really laid the foundation for the truth that he was going to declare. And we see in our passage today and a little bit next week that Jesus was able to declare this truth to the people, to the multitudes that were following him. 
We see that in just a little bit, a couple weeks further down, he's going to declare this truth to this uh, religious leaders, the Pharisees. And eventually at the end of chapter 6, he's going to declare this truth to the disciples, those who are kind of that intimate circle. And so this grace is demonstrated, this compassion is shown, but the foundation is that he can declare truth. And we see this perfect balance of grace and truth. And I think just the takeaway for us is we need to be about that as well. That we need to be about declaring truth, but it needs to be done in grace. It needs to be done in compassion, just like Christ. So, Pastor, come share with us where we're at today. Excellent. Great way to set this up because we are at this portion of Scripture now where we're going to see Jesus declaring truth on the heels of demonstrating grace. Marcus did a great job last week. I listened to the, the video and just really enjoyed his preaching last week that, uh, of, of setting out that miracle of walking on the water and even before that the miracle of feeding the, the multitude, feeding the thousands. And great demonstration of grace, but in a sense that was done to set up an opportunity to speak truth. So that's where we're looking at this, and we're, we're seeing the aftermath of that demonstration of grace, those, those miraculous events. And we are in the Gospel of John in chapter 6. I'm going to pick this up at about verse 22. Now the intention was that we were going to get to this statement, I am the bread of life, and just really the, the high point of the conversation. Um, I'll tell you right off, we're not going to get there today. This is so meaty. There's so much stuff here. There's so much good stuff here that we just want to take some time and... and dive back into it. And as Marcus said, now we're going to look at it carefully. We're going to get the magnifying glass out again, and we're going to dig in to what the scripture says for us. So John in chapter 6, starting at verse 22, this is the aftermath. Now, this is what happened as a result of those miracles. The next day, the crowd stood on the other side of the sea and saw that there was no other small boat there ex except the one that Jesus except the one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where, he had, where they had ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boat and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi... When did you get here? Now, this is interesting, just as John gives us some of the details and, and, and plays out the setting for us, that there is a multitude that is willing to follow Jesus. And from all human account, if we were looking at this simply as a human organization, we'd say, wow, Jesus is being pretty effective here, that Jesus is successful here. And I wonder if there weren't any of his followers, maybe even some of the 12 who would come up to him and say, Jesus, you know, you're doing a great job. You're, you're, you're just being successful. I mean, get a look at these people. Look at the extent that they're willing to travel just to be near you. I mean, you tried to sneak away, and they followed you, and they came across the lake too, and, and you're just doing a great job, Jesus. Well, the truth is, Jesus was never concerned about gathering a following. He really wasn't concerned about gathering a following, and that kind of sets up this idea here, because they're coming to seek him, and they ask him a question, and he, notice he doesn't really answer their question. When did you get here? And immediately he launches into another discussion. Immediately he launches into the revelation of a more significant truth because he's not interested in gathering a following. In fact, he senses that they are following him for a wrong reason. That he's fo they're following for an incorrect reason. So he begins to focus their hearts and their minds, and in a sense, he answers their question with a question. Look at verse 26. It's not phrased as a question, but he begins to challenge them. And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. In, in, in a sense, we can hear Jesus say, Why are you following me? Why are you here? Why are you following? And we want to look at that and examine that because that's a great question for us to think about. Why are we following Jesus? Why do you follow Jesus? And we want to make sure that we do that for the right reasons. Again, look at what he said here. As he, he kind of lays out 
these two alternatives. Why are you following me is the question that's behind this statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And, you know, there are two alternatives here. And as we say this, I hope that you recognize that these alternatives are, are possibly true in our lives as well. First alternative is that they, they sensed that they could get something out of Jesus. And that was true for most of them. They sensed that they could get something out of Jesus, and that's what he said. You're, you're not following me for any other reason, but you ate bread and you were filled, and, and maybe you want a replay of that. Maybe that was just thrilling, and, and you want to go back, and you want to experience that again, that you sensed you could get something out of me. Now, by the way, that's not always a bad thing. That's not always a bad thing. In fact, in the Gospels, we see individuals coming to Jesus because they are desperate in need. We see that several times when there is a family member who comes to plead for a child or, or a master who comes to plead for his servant and they are at wit's end and they have no other resource and they desperately need something from Jesus and so they follow to where he is and they seek him out because they need something, they want something from him. It's not a bad thing. And even today that often drives us to the Lord when we realize that there is a need and, and things that we have hoped for are stripped away and we are left exposed and we are left vulnerable and that often drives us to our knees and drives us to Jesus because we need something from him and that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes we're driven to Jesus simply because we need to be loved. You know, I, I think of Mary Magdalene and that story that when the whole world used and discarded her, she found in Jesus somebody who loved her unconditionally. She needed that from him. Sometimes that's our story too, that we just need somebody who will love us unconditionally. So it, it's not necessarily always a bad thing to come to Jesus because we sense we can get something from him or need something from him. But we want to be very careful about that. That that's not our motive, and that motive can easily be twisted. Jesus began this conversation with these words, you seek me not because you saw signs. What does he mean by that? I think if we look at that and unfold that a minute, you say, you're not coming because you recognized something in what you just experienced that you saw the feeding of thousands and you knew that that was miraculous and, and, and you're not coming, they should have come because they recognized who he was in that. That they recognized that that wasn't a mere man that was doing those things. That they should have recognized that he is the eternal self-existing God who took on human flesh and they came to, and followed him simply because now he is worthy to be followed. How do we follow him? What do we recognize in Jesus? Do we follow him simply because we want to get something out of him? Or do we follow him because he's worthy to be worshipped because he is the eternal, self-existing God who took on human flesh? There's a phrase that uh, just kind of rolling through my mind these last, last days, and, and I hope this makes sense when I say this, but it, it's the choice. You have to ask yourself, is Jesus the end or is he simply a means to an end? Is Jesus your all in all? Or do you use Jesus to get something that makes your life comfortable, makes your life easier? Is he the end? Or is he the means to the end? And even as I say that, understand that in, in my heart and in my mind, there's this ongoing tension because I can't quite figure that out. And I wrestle with that, and it's not easily defined. It doesn't easily come into place. There is this tension. Because uh, on one side, we know there is blessing in following Jesus. There is blessing. There is hope in, in a place of hopelessness. There is peace when the world is in turmoil. And, and Jesus himself promised and said, I came that they might have life and have it how? To the full, have it abundantly. That's a great promise. Doesn't mean I get everything that I want, but it means that there's, there's blessing in following Jesus. And in fact, James, the book of James tells us that every good gift is from above, that our Heavenly Father knows how to and delights in giving good gifts to his children. You know what? There is blessing in being a follower of Jesus. But am I using Jesus 
just to make my life easier. You know, there's, there's a very subtle difference here. There's a very subtle difference, but it's an important difference. About, and, and the difference between being blessed because you follow Jesus or following Jesus as a means to gain some blessing. And it goes to where our heart attitude is and our motive and our perspective. And again, I wrestle with that until I look at it this way. And let me challenge you with this thought. You know, we have it pretty easy here. How many of you have eaten already today? Yep, 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 yep. Some, how many will eat later today? And you know that, yeah, see, we know that. We have it pretty easy here. What if all of that was stripped away from you? What if that wasn't an option or wasn't a certainty? What if your declaration to be a follower of Jesus meant that your family would disown you? Because that's the reality in a lot of the world right now. You declared yourself to be a follower of Jesus and your family disowned you and, and shunned you. And, and not only that, but your employment was stripped from you because you declared that you were a follower of Jesus. And, and your possessions were forfeit. So you're an outcast. And you're a target of persecution. In fact, you are daily living in danger of losing your life. If that was your reality, would you follow Jesus simply because he's worthy to be followed? Or do you follow Jesus because life is good and comfortable and pleasant? There's a huge difference there. And again, there's this tension in my mind because I know God has promised that it's good to follow. There's blessing in being obedient to Christ. And, and so Jesus brings this back to them. He said, I, I want you to understand this. Why are you following me? And, and you're not following me because you recognized who I am. You didn't see the signs and recognize that I am the eternal self-existing God. I'm the one that God has promised from the very beginning. But you sense that you can get something out of me. And you know, by the way, if Jesus were simply interested in gaining a following, he would have just kept doing what he had just done. Bread and games. Bread and games. You know, in fact, that was a strategy of the Roman Empire at that time. The Roman Empire set aside 93 days of public games at government expense. You know why? Because they figured out it was easier to entertain the people than to fight against the people. So if Jesus simply wanted a following, he would have just, you know, occasionally throw out a miracle, tell the people what they wanted to hear, and they would have followed him anywhere. But he wasn't concerned about fo a following. He was concerned about his kingdom. And he was concerned about us being part of that kingdom. So with that, we look and we, we look at him kind of changing the focus. It really is a matter of having an eternal perspective. And that's how we wrestle with this thing. Am I following Jesus because there's a blessing in that for me? Or am I blessed just because I follow Jesus? Well, it's a matter of eternal perspective. And he touches on that next. Look at verse 27 as he begins to unfold this now. He says, do not work for food which perishes but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. It's about having an eternal perspective. And obviously, he's talking more than just about food. It's not just about food at this point. It's not about having a free lunch. And later, he's going to pull in this idea of being the bread of life. And, and I wonder, too, if the people get that because they're talking about food again. But it's really not about food. What he's doing is he's looking at this big picture. This is a bigger analogy. And I kind of think that even feeding the 5,000 was a setup to talk about this, this bigger picture, this more important matter. Don't, don't work for food which perishes. You know, it's not about food. And so maybe let's do this. And I hope that we're not guilty of manipulating and corrupting and changing the word of God. But, but substitute for the words the food, just substitute the word that. And it really comes into focus when we do that. So when we look at that text and we, we see the words not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, well, in, instead use the word that. Do not work for that which perishes but for that which endures for eternal life. And the question is, what do you, 
What are you striving about? What are you busy about? Where's your efforts? Where's your attention? What occupies the majority of your time and your attention? Is it about the things that will perish? Or are you about the things that will last for eternal life? And that's the eternal perspective that Jesus is now trying to and, and starting to focus as he demonstrates the grace now proclaiming the truth. That it's not just about food, and it's not just about getting what you want, and it's not about making your life comfortable, and it's not even about overthrowing this Roman government. It's about something much bigger than that. It's something much greater than that. So where is your focus? Don't strive. Don't labor. Don't contend for. Don't be busy about that which will perish. But be busy about that which will last for eternal life. You know... There's much that distracts us from that. You recognize that? There's much that distracts us from being focused on that which is eternal, and we fuss over things that are temporary, we fret and worry over things that are temporary. We contend for things that are temporary, which we realize in a generation or a decade or a year or a week really won't matter much. Jesus said, don't be so focused on the things that are going to fade away. Focus on that which will last. By the way, we know that the things that last are the things that we have in Christ. Look again what he says there in verse 27. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for that which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. By the way, did you notice that, that Jesus calls himself the Son of Man there? You ever wonder why those two things? John really emphasizes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus just called himself the Son of Man. What's, what is that about? You ever wonder why and how those two fit together? Don't take this to mean that Jesus is backing off of previous claims. You remember, as we looked at this a couple weeks ago, this is where the contention started, that Jesus claimed to be son of the most high God, that he claimed to be the son of God. The people understood that pretty clearly, and they were, they were in an uproar about that. So we don't read this to say, well, maybe Jesus is kind of backing off that statement a little bit. Maybe Jesus is trying to calm the waters a little bit, and kind of, kind of diffuse the situation. That's not it at all. In fact, Jesus is actually claiming the same thing that John claims. John calls him the son of God. Jesus said, I am the son of man. And, and we look at it as two sides of that same coin, two sides of the same truth. That John understood that this man that he walked with was the eternal God who took on human flesh. He is the son of God. And Jesus simply says it from the other side, that he is the son of man, that he is the eternal self-existing God, that he chose to be born of a woman like no one was ever born before, that he's the son of man, that he is completely God and he is completely man. And by the way, you understand that critical truth, it has to be that way. That all that we have, all that we hope for is in this fact that he is the son. And that's our, our hope for life. You understand that, right? Because if he's not completely God, and if he wasn't completely human, we are still left hopeless. But we do have hope, and we do have life, and we do have something that is eternal because the eternal self-existing God took on human flesh for us. And on that, God has set his seal. Another interesting phrase. I, let me just talk about that briefly, really quick. We say that, and first thing that comes to mind is a seal of approval, and that's partially a correct picture here. It's a seal of approval that God approves of everything that Jesus was doing and everything that he was saying. And, and that in itself is an evidence that he was correct because if he wasn't correct, God wouldn't have approved it and, and probably condemned it and, and, well, the wrath of God would have been poured out. So in a sense, it's, it's a stamp, a seal of approval. But again, don't twist that idea around. Don't get that twisted to think that Jesus was working and God took notice of that and said, well, you know, that's not bad. In fact, that, that might just work. Okay, I approve of that. Because nowhere and at no time did Jesus ever go off on his own agenda and accomplish his own purpose. 
You know, by the way, there is a major religious group in our, in our area, around the world, that has this idea, this really twisted gospel that, that, that God wanted to come up with a plan to save the world, and so Jesus came up with a plan, and his brother Lucifer came up with a plan, and God chose Jesus' plan and ticked Lucifer off. That's the basis of his theology. It's not God choosing one plan over the other and saying, okay, that looks like a good one. Really, we understand this more with... Uh, a mark of authenticity and a seal of authority. And it ha goes back to that father and son relationship again, that a ruling father would give his seal to his son and say, now when you act, you're acting in my name. And when you decree, you are decreeing in my name and you're acting with all of the authority and with all of the power of my kingdom. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Don't strive. Don't contend for that which is going to perish. But you need to be concerned with that which will last forever. And that's what I'm going to give you. And God has given me this seal. God is behind this plan. In fact, this has been the purpose of God all along. This has been his purpose and his plan. So that's where we want to focus. And that's where we need to be about. It's always been about his plan. But as we think about that, it's not a matter of what we do. It really is a matter of what we are about and having that eternal perspective. And as we look at this conversation unfold a little bit, uh, we get this idea that they missed what Jesus was saying. They, they missed what he was emphasizing at this point. Go back to verse 27. He says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, the Father, God, has set his seal. Don't work for the perishing, work for the eternal. And God has set his seal on this, and this is going to last, and this is going to endure forever. Now, they missed that, because they picked up on the word work. They, and they, they picked up on this idea of work for that which is going to last forever. You have to work for the eternal life. Jesus was emphasizing something else. Jesus emphasized I'm going to give to you eternal life. What you need to be concerned with is what I'm going to give to you, and I'm going to give you that eternal life. But they didn't hear the word give. They heard the word work, and they picked up on this idea, well, we, now we need to work for eternal life. We don't need to be work and busy about e temporary things. We need to work for eternal life. But it's not about working. It's not about being busy with things. It's about, it's about what we are occupied with, subtle difference. There are two words here. I want to look at these quickly. Two words in, in these verses, and, and they're both translated work or works. Do not work for the food which perishes. And then a little later on, they say, what work must we do to do the work of God? And then Jesus responds and says, this is the work of God. Actually, two similar but different words. Similar related words, but there's a significant difference between those words. And the first word that we see there is ergazomia. Now, you were really impressed that I said that in, with my Greek accent. Ergazomia. Doesn't mean anything to me except I understand this. It means to strive, to labor, to toil. It, it, it has to do with um, what you do and then you get a response. You get wages because you worked for it. So it, it's that day-to-day -day routine. It's the task. It's the things that you have to do. But the word that's used later in that verse, this is the work of God. It's not ergazomia, but it's ergo, ergon. And it simply means the occupation of, the concern of. And so split it out this way. And, and it's not about the details. It's not about doing your checklist and say, this is what I have to do and check that off. And if I check off all my list in an appropriate amount of time, then, then I get something from God. I'm going to get some reward from God. And it's not about the doing, but it's being about what God is concerned about. This is what God is concerned about. Not, not the doing details, but this is his concern. This is what he is about. And we go back to that phrase and ask, what occupies the majority of your time and your attention? What occupies that? What are you occupied with? Well, here at the bottom, I'm going to look at this briefly. Jesus tells us what God is occupied with. And he tells us what we should be occupied with too. This is the work of him, of God. That you believe in him whom he has sent. 
What do I have to do? What work? What detail? What task do I have to check off? It's not about tasks. Here's what you need to be about. Believe in. Believe in. Believe in the one that he has sent. And as we look at that, understand that there are some details about that. We believe what Jesus said about himself. Not simply this vague, abstract, yeah, I kind of believe in Jesus and I'll define what that means. But we have to believe definitely what did Jesus say about himself. And we go back to the truth that's been unfolded here in these recent weeks. Jesus very clearly claims to be the eternal self-existing God who took on human flesh. He claims to be the Son of God. And you can either accept that or you can reject it. But don't try to change the statement because he says it. So you have to believe what he says about himself. And then with that, then we begin to believe what he says about us. That we've failed, faltered, that we are marred with sin, that we are perishing. And then we have to believe what he says about salvation. That he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. But through him there is hope. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish and will not perish but will have eternal life. And that's the means of salvation. And we're not going to add to it. and We're not going to subtract from it. That's what we believe. And that's what God would be about. That's the business of God. That's the concern of God. That's the eternal perspective that Jesus wants to begin to implant in the hearts of these who are following that they would follow for the correct reason, not simply because life was better when they were hanging around Jesus, but that he was worthy to be worshipped, and in him there is life. Not something temporary, but something eternal. So the question is, why are we following, and what are we about? What business are we about? That really needs to be our business, too. That we would believe, but also that we would be about proclaiming that message that there is hope in Jesus if you just grab a hold of that and believe. In him there is life. And it's good. And by the way, there's blessing in him. But he's worthy. He's worthy to be followed even if we rarely experience that blessing. Amen? Amen. There's much more here. And that only just kind of sets up what we'll look at next as Jesus begins to unfold the truth and this purpose and plan of God as he declares himself and describes himself as the bread of life. But you'll have to come back next week for that. Father, this day, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you that in a world that is in turmoil, in a world that is full of confusion, in a world that is full of pain and sorrow, that you always remain the same. You are our rock. Father, we thank you that in clinging to you, there is blessing and there is hope and there is joy and there is peace, and we desire that. But Father, we would pray that you would always give us an eternal perspective, that we wouldn't simply be concerned with the things that are perishing, but the things that are eternal. And as we do that, Father, we would know your heart even more. We thank you for a time in your word. We pray that these truths would continue just to echo in our hearts and in our minds, that we would mold those over and come to an understanding of what you have for us. And Father, this day, even as we leave this place, uh, having feasted on your word, we would, we would go and feast on food and enjoy fellowshipping together. And we would pray that that would be a sweet, sweet time of fellowship. So we ask your blessing on that. We ask your blessing on us. And Father, again, use us for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name.